Yellow lights trail the last of daylight on oily, curling, lagging water, crossing the town with keening pancho, dogging my staggering heels, gurning and cursing me. Flashback. New world, raucous laughter, a sundown of the mind. The New York Night. Hailing a cab, I black out on tar. I'm slapped back awake by the cop nagging. Do you know who you are? My first poem, I think. The beginning. Der Bowman Poet. Spring Song, 1941. The beginning. Today is my birthday. I am 17. My hometown has just been blown up. Dead feet and dead faces, corpses still alight, students helping kids and old people out of still burning houses. I have nothing to write poems about. This is my 20th century nightlife. Ancient memories of childhood, Belfast, East Street, the markets, in the rain, running on sweaty cobblestones to this or that mill girl, hoping she was mother, Daisy Fox with the bun on top, Kitty who? McKnight, who nursed me, and Auntie Mary, the eternal, but mother? No, no. She was always somewhere else, with someone else, giving suck to brother Rory on the sands in Bangor, her long black hair streaming with the wind from the sea, an Irish sea. At night she would come in and shower me with kisses, but her scent betrayed her. She was going out about the town down the town. Still, we had our memories, ma'am and I. Two Solitudes. America, mom. You are baking bread. I am making a poem. We glow with silence like the full moon. We are both obliged to wait then for the ring of cindering bone. You are baking bread until it sings. I am baking clay until it glazes. Time is an oven. You for your moth-coloured grain to golden. Me for my glass pages. I was the oldest, the first born alive. Daddy went off early to America and, and became an American barman. He had to get out because they were killing Catholic barmen in Belfast, whether they were involved in the troubles or not. My mother was a fierce Republican and there was no way she was going to get out of her own country. Well, except for Daddy. She followed him across the water, trailing us children with her. Alive, alive, oh. The altar boy from a mass for the dead romps through the streets of the town, lulls on brick-studded glass, jumps up, bolts back down with wild pop eyes. This morning, a twist of winter to spring, small hands clutched a big brass cross, followed the stern brow of the priest and circled a man in the box. A bell-tossed head sneezed in a blue daze of incense and shriveled bit lips then, just to stay awake, prayed too loud for the man to be at rest. Oh, now, where has he got to? but climbed an apple tree. <laughs> Me, an altar boy. Hard to imagine, isn't it? 
But at one time it was true, my self-same piety of imagination would lead me up to all sorts. Son of a gun. Between the year of the slump and the sellout, I, the third child, am the firstborn alive. My father is a free stater, Cavan buck. My mother is a Belfast factory worker. Both carry guns. And a grandmother with a gun in her apron, making the military wipe their boots before they rape the house. These civil wars are only ever over on paper. Armed police are still raping my dreams. Thump thud, thump thud. I go on nightmaring. Dead father running. There is a bull in the field. His father, am I running away from the bull to it? Is this the reason why I steal time, things, places, people? Barman father, sleeping with a gun under your pillow. Does the gun help you that much? I wonder. For the gun has made you all only the one. In of sex with me, the two sex son of three or none. You bequeathed the gun to still cannot make it so I can never become your he-man shot down as I was sure I thought and thought and thought but blood ran I was five when we went to New York like most of the wanting Irish we were always going to America us kids to meet our daddy Ben as if for the first time Maybe it was, for I was never sure who my father was. Uh, and so we were told when we got there not to say we'd wash our hands anymore, but we'd wash our hands. And we mustn't say, okay, anymore, but say, yeah, sure, okay. People in Belfast all come down to say their goodbyes at the docks sang Auld Lang Syne. Leaving seemed permanent. Forever. We landed in Halifax. We had such a good time on the boat, but on arriving we would have gone back in an instant. We'd been told so much about New York, and I really wanted to see it, but at but, but at Halifax there was another brick wall, and even a bigger one. My stupid daddy had missed the train to the boat to meet us, to clear immigration. So we sat, disappointed, beside our bags, waiting until some fireman or, or a policeman or somebody or another came to help us. Standing Water Putting into Nova Scotia, 19 and 29. Girl, mother's delf face creaks, cracks. I'm breaking in two myself at five. Good night all from the beginning. Goodbye cobblestones. But a back street womb wall won't let me climb out over it. We stare at the brick. Halifax sky, a yellow wolf cold, sits on the leaden Atlantic, a new world horizon, old morning, you are the night of life, the Russian Orthodox priest who has a beard is the bogeyman, will put me in his bag, is America the berry hole he'll put me in if I cry? And the tiny, oh, it stops tangoing, transoceanic motor ship. 
New York was full of bright lights and yellow taxis and movement. I love the brightness and the noise of everything any kid would. And I was excited. But as I was very close to my mother, I knew she did not want to go to America. And it was no surprise that she came to hate it. And so did I. I came to hate every part of New York, even the brightness and excitement, because my mother hated it. She never saw how glittery it was. Dad, on the other hand, fulfilled the American dream and rose from bartender to someone who owned his own grocery stores, one in Harlem and one in Amsterdam Avenue. He said the blacks paid their bills, but not the Irish. <laughs> how it happened, I, I can't remember, but no sooner did he soar to the peaks and he lost it all after a long time. Dad finally got a job as a subway clerk. I helped him with the fractions and math until he passed the civil service exams. Mother still hated America, but not as much as she used to. She's beginning to hate life itself. She rarely goes out. We are hanging out at the front room windows on pillows. We face Broadway. The cars and buses bumper to bumper are streaming down to Times Square. So many cars. It's only the world passing by, she sighs and reads Yeats to me. A person would be better off dead, she complains of existence. She never did see Ireland again. How I love Mother and how I love Dad. But I must get away. I, I, I can't cope with or bear their unhappiness any longer. Mum and Dad were to die in New York. Goodbye to our father. Father asleep in Central Park without a hole to hide in. You're dead now, but not inside. Inside it is still old 1920 wirelesses, jangle glass beads. Aye, you steal back for the cop to beat you over the head with the nightstick. For drunk as sin, singing the red flag again. But nobody cares. It's not an insult anymore. Things bare teeth back to gums and skull. Grins to privates. I see your bone naked face scrutinizing injustices still. Never bother. You have a hole to hide in now. Hide in the bog pit waste we've made of this place ourselves by just running away from it. Soldiers. The altar boy marches up the altar steps. The priest marches down. Get up now and be a soldier, says the nun. To the woman after giving birth. Get up and march. March, be a man. And the men are men, and the women are men, and the children are men. Mother carried a knife to work. It was the thorn to her rose. They say she died with her eyes open in the French hospital in New York. I remember those eyes shining in the dark, slum, hallway, the day after I left the monastery. Eyes that were a feast of welcome that said, Yes, I'm glad you didn't stay stuck there. Would you mind if I went to prison rather than war? No, son, for Ireland's men all went to prison. At the bottom of a canyon of brick, she cursed and swore, You never see the sky! A lifetime after, just before, 
I go to sleep at night, I hear that Anna Magnani voice screaming me deaf. No, 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 you're not to heed the world. In one swift sentence, she tells me not to yield, but to forbear. Go to prison, but never. Never stop fighting. We are the poor, and the poor have to be soldiers. You're still a soldier. It's only that you're losing the war. And all wars are lost anyway. Then I joined a seminary. <laughs> Me? Seminary. <laughs> now, I did study to be a priest, of course. Mm, yeah. Well, I fucked that up. I was never totally interested in becoming a priest. I mean, the nuns at my first school told me not to go to Harren High School because it was in Hell's Kitchen. The nuns also said, go to any school that teaches Latin. And with Harren being the only school nearby to teach Latin, I wrote and applied when I was 13 or 14. Ah, te tum, hum ha, hum ha, hum ha. Italian, Latin? Ah. About as good as getting yourself an Alsatian dog. My mother's side of the family were not that religious. But on my father's side, I had my Aunt Mary who took me to do the Stations of the Cross. I could never understand, though, how Christ as the Son of God could allow those bastards to torture him. And yet, that's complicated, for the image came with my awareness of sex and death. I'd look at the soldiers, those uh, centurions, with their muscular legs. And at the time, I was 13, I had just started reading Dostoevsky's The Brothers Karamazov, where Father Zosima's body gives off a smell when he dies. He was supposed to be a saint, but he gives off a foul odour. Dostoevsky talks truth and faces reality. God, even a big horsefly came out of the saint's body. Sometimes I felt trapped in the monastery. I, 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 used to, I used to jump up and down on my glasses and smash them so I could get home. I remember an old priest who was sympathetic to the Irish climbing the hill to the monastery and meeting me in a yellow shirt and black jacket and tan boots. And he stops me and asks, Where are you going in that get-up? So I told him I didn't want to end up looking like a penguin. Hmm. But of course, he made me climb the hill and put on the black suit. They were strict, you see. I just didn't have the habits of a monk. I had to leave regimental orders in 1945. Abandoning studies. I do not know what salmon do after they leave their young in a cloud of milk or where they go or why lovers die and I do not want to. All the sages wrote their names in sand, watch the mystery wash I do not understand. With wave on wave of wind I am content to be brave as blind. I left New York in 1943. I said goodbye to New York, goodbye, goodbye forever. Well, at least seven times in 30 years. Dog to heel. The last time was because uh, a relative had committed suicide. For a long time, I lived in hope that I'd never see her bright lights and her noisy company again. But how do you escape New York? In 1948, I renounced my American citizenship in Belfast. Now, five years in a post-war Belfast, smouldering in bombed-out ruins, fuel shortages, clothes and food rationing, and no work. 
two years back in Ireland and with my Irish passport that says Belfast era, I'm targeted as the biggest nut of the day. Aunt Mary drags me down to the dole people, but she can't keep her mouth shut. This gentleman here is under three flags. The dole clerk freezes. I know that, I know that. But what is he? Is he Irish, British or American? Or even I don't know. The cops won't give me a permanent ID card. Somehow I frightened them, but not as much as they frightened me. Long black coats and even longer faces. In Belfast I wrote poems for magazines. I was included in New Irish Poets in the late 1940s. I gave them poems and my Aunt Mary took me down to the photographer and stood behind him shouting, Stop grinning! Only fools grin, you fool you! And so I was included, grinning, as the youngest poet. And it was those poems that Nancy, later to be my wife, read ten years later, when she was working in a bookshop in America. She began to write to me. She fell for those poems, their innocence, hook, line and sinker, and I was amazed. I guess we were both religious and romantic, even if I was a manic depressive. Nancy linked in with the religious element in the poems. Look at Chant Ran of a Singer, such innocence. In Belfast, I renounced my American citizenships. I would now be what? What would I be? An Irish poet. Gloss. Nor truth nor good did they know, but beauty burning away. They were the dark earth people of old, restive in the clay. Deirdre watch Nisha die, and great King Connor of himself said, Did you ever see a bottomless bucket in the muck discarded? And comradely Dermot was destroyed by Finn. Sorry. And comradely Dermot was destroyed by Fionn because of the beauty of a girl. Because of the beauty of a girl, the sky went raging on fire and the sea was pushed out into rage. They were the dark earth people of old, and Deirdre pitched herself into the sea, turned the page, turned the page. Tenth century invasion. Doves beat their wings against their breasts, bloodying their wings, bloodying their breasts. Bells ring throughout the book at the bottom of the lock. Gold running over the ruined page, drowned, emerald and lilac ink from the song written, the shaft of the sun in the moment on the margin shall never be sung. No, it's Family deaths and crisis called me back to New York and Hell's Kitchen throughout the 40s and the 50s, where I met and married Nancy in 1956. She came with me to settle in Glengormley. I suppose that coming back to the North brought back my childhood, which I had tried to avoid. I had been born into the Civil War here when they were just making Northern Ireland. Although I was only a child, I knew there was something wrong. My grandmother was burnt out of her house in Lisbon and she went mad and delusional. Even as a child, I could sense her paranoia about me wandering off, the way children do. One day wandering off into Lagan Street, one day and seeing these two kids blurting, pointed to a man who was whipping a horse, 
and I went over to ask him not to whip the horse, calling him a bad beast. And he turned and asked, Do you want me to whip ye? He meant it. Oncoming civil war. Salmon, silvering grey to die the summers of the past day. Trapped in our own shallow, chill shadows, and slowly a whole season's twilight bleeds like a blue blood's at the least scathing. Opens out the silk clouds by their fingering pine against the going away to the sea sky. Cannot be wrenched back, nor hoarded, but given only as the black evergreens go on living high up ever the mountain hill wall high up over this little mill town the mornings growing darker with sundown so when i come back in the 50s and i tried to live in the suburbs in gormley hmm, i guess we were trying to get out of a ghetto mentality even in the 60s there was still a well there was still a certain amount of hope we clan kids, O'Neill met Lamas, and all that kind of thing. Nancy and I were very much in love. There were bad omens, though. I remember two wee blackbirds getting trapped between the nylon drape and the window and fluttering madly, not able to get out. As I released them, the sky dark and the shadow came across the window just as they escaped. I'm a poet who believes in omens. There was news that Nancy's brother, who was schizophrenic, had killed himself. There was the troubles. Things conspired against us. I started getting migraines. Nancy got ill too. All that medical stuff. Well, well it's all in the poems. Hemorrhage and migraine. The doctors told Nancy that my problem was not physical. They put me away for 10 days or so in the hospital, of course. I told all the people in there to get up out of their beds and get on with it. For this was all just a conspiracy with the lunatics against us. They had to let me out. St. Coleman's song for flight, for Nancy and Bridget flown. Run like rats from the plague in you before death. It is no virtue to be dead. The Cranach in the water anywhere is all sure. It is no virtue and it is not nature to wait to rise into the ground. Not one in the Bible could see these dead packed on top of the other like dung, nor the two Josephs in Egypt, but would not run. And Christ's blessing follow. It is not a blessing to escape storm. Pray to old Joseph, not a witless man who had the brains not to want to die. But when his time came only and at home in bed, the door shut on the world, that wolf outside munching the leper's head. The secret of my work is my wife Nancy, her leaving me the loss. I was left on the ground when she left with our beautiful baby daughter. The troubles and my marriage breakdown became, they just became fused in my head. Goodbye to Bridget, Agnes Day. I take you by the hand, your eyes mirroring the traffic lights are green and orange and red. The military lorries by our side drown out your child heart thumping tired under the soot black thorn trees these exhaust fume greasy mornings. My little girl, 
my Lamb of God. I'd like to set you free from bitch Belfast as we pass the arm to the teeth barracks and descend the road into the school grounds of broken windows from a spate of car bombs. But don't forgive me for not. Intimate Letter, 1973. Our power as part of Belfast has decapitated lampposts now. Our meeting place, the bookshop, is a gaping black hole of charred timber. Remember that night with you, invalided in the top room when they were throwing petrol bombs through the windows of Catholics, how my migraine grew to such a pitch. Bridget said, Mummy, I think Daddy's going to burst. We all run away from each other's particular hell. I didn't survive you and her thrown to the floor when they blew up the co-op at the bottom of the street, or Bridget waking screaming after this or that explosion. Really, I was the first one to go. It was I who left you. <sighs> Odor of blood when Christ was slain, made in all platonic tolerance vain, and vain all Doric discipline. Ah, I put Yeats and Lawrence at the front of the book, talking about blood, and Joyce talks about bleeding for his torn bow by the black stream. Inside the book, which takes you back to crucifixion, that Yeats quote is one of his deepest and darkest perceptions. It's a bloody book. Don't leave that book on the coffee table. Tolerance and just about everything else, included philosophy, goes out the window when crucifixions start happening. Christ is the enemy in the book, and in a century as dark as this one, he is the enemy. Oh, goodbye. One. Dandering home from work at midnight, they tripped him up on a ramp, asked him if he was a Catholic. A wee bit soft in the head he was. The last person in the world you'd want to hurt. His arms and legs broken. His genitals roasted with a shipyard worker's blow lamp. In all the stories that the Christian brothers tell you of Christ, he never screamed like this. Surely this is not the way to show a man bearing, screaming for them to please stop. And then later, like screaming for death. When they made him wash the stab wounds at the sink, they kept on hammering him with the pickaxe handle. Then they pulled Christ's trousers down, threatened to cut off his balls, poor boy Christ, for when they finally got round to finishing him off by shooting him in the back of the head, the poor Fenian fucker was already dead. The poet is alone. The wolf outside munching the leprous head, Christ's goodbye was hardly a poem to write. Then, then glass, grass. And I don't understand, I, I still don't understand why they would want to torture someone like that innocent old Protestant man I had dinner with in Rathcool. I often wonder what happened to him. I try to get near to the killer mentally in, in this book. And Father Des Wilson says he still can't understand the sentiments in the book. Behind the book is the murder of Jerry McLaughlin, a poor innocent boy who, who used to come visit me in Glengormley and bring some chips and beer and keep me company when we needed or when we weeded the garden. God, <laughs> we didn't even use weed killer. 
One day you switch from classical music to Radio Ulster and you just find out they murdered him. I'd seen too much when I came to write that book. I was, I still am, bitter. I can't understand. I just can't understand. The Ditch of Dawn for Jerry McLaughlin. How I admired your bravado, dandering down the road alone, in the dark yelling, I'll see you again tomorrow, but they pump six bullets into you. Now you're lying in a mud puddle of blood, yelling. There is no goodbye, no safe home in this coffin country where your hands are clawed. How can I tell anyone I'm born, born lying in this ditch of a cold Belfast dawn with the bullet mangled body of a dead boy and can't get away? A young Brit soldier wanders over to my old donkey hunk of bitter miserere of dereliction on the street. What is it, mate? What is it? What's wrong? What's wrong? In turn E. It is not absolutely fair, it is not absolutely wrong, and it does not hurt to be jeered at when you are hanging upside down, when hanging upside down hurts more. Enemies. At the gas and electric offices, black boats with white sails float down the stairs, frightening the five-year-old wee Protestant girls. Nuns, nuns, one of them yells, when are you going to get married? Huh? When the ricocheting bullet bites into the young child wanting to walk in her mummy's high heels to push the doll's pram, she gives a funny little, oh, and lets the blood spill all over the bright new bib. Enemy encounter. Dumping. Left over from the autumn, dead leaves near a culvert, I come on a British army soldier with a rifle and a radio, perched hiding. He has red hair. He's young enough to be my weenie bopper daughter's boyfriend. He is like a lonely little winter robin. We are that close to each other's. I can nearly hear his heart beating. I say something bland to make him grin, but his glass eyes look past my side, whiskers down the shore road street. I am an Irishman and he is afraid that I have come to kill him. <sighs> I'm aware that in compiling this anthology I might be accused of a cynical exploitation of what it is hoped a transient situation. Mm. It's self-evident, however, that the violence, division and hatred that in their present acute phase disfigure the face of Ireland have roots that run deeper and spread wider than the events of these past six years. Whether or not any of the poems in this anthology have the mark of greatness is for future generations of readers to judge. But there is a time to keep silence and a time to speak. At the very least, there is nothing in this anthology that did not cry out to be said. And that is surely more than enough to justify its existence. So when I was accused by some of carrying on a vigorous guerrilla campaign against the earnest, honest Ulster establishment of pedabed pyjama poets, I plead guilty. I'm hostile to what they stand for. I know three Faber poets personally and they all have in common an odour of sanctity. Yeah. Talking to any one of them is always like talking, well it's almost like talking to a holy picture. 
They answer back like old-time students for the priesthood, and the weest of them all talks down his nose to you like a bishop. Mm. Why is this? Well, the answer is because getting published by Faber is canonization in one's own lifetime. It means... Who, who's uh, like me since leather arse died? Yeah. Well, what's wrong with a little puffed-up play-acting triumphalism anyway? Oh, well, there's nothing wrong with it. Everything's wrong with it. Poetry and religion ought not to be kept locked away in a watertight compartment by the cosy select few. Poetry and religion belong to the people, not to some whiter-than-white clique, some monopoly of others, baptising themselves as the elite, pushing towards the maximum regimentation of the arts and religion because their frightened greed demands a bank-like military security. They lock themselves up in craftily wrought but sterile facades of versifications, like hiding in some well-furnished pub lounge. It's the life inside the shell that matters. Glass, grass. Try to understand that you yourself are guilty of every atrocity, however far from you it seems to be happening. Gunter Eich. The scorched cloth smell of burnt flesh from morning, a bomb in one of the park cars, the golds glinting like ice on asphalt in April, the sun in a smog of cheap petrol exhaust fumes, all bring on the sinusy migraine. Trudging against an east wind from the cement factory, Awful bad for the chest. I wade through broken glass and a yellowing black smoke, through steel smouldering street. There's broken glass in my wedding shoes. I wore them for luck. Crossing the shadow deflected town that burns, crossing the always takes, never gives man. Crossing our bounces, crossing our stunted lives, crossing the starlings with football-kicking kids who make the telephone cables do a war dance. Once I sipped at your wanton wonder like wine. Now everything taken back from us is reflected back in to this Chinese lacquered black obeyed, like piano music in a French film breaks into bits of staccato shooting from an M1. Ducking flying glass from the workers cleaning up afterwards, I take to the middle of Royal Avenue on my way in gold-rimmed polarides to give a poetry reading in Bally Murphy, clutching at ragged editions of my own poems, like clutching at strands of grass to hold you up from falling, with the crashing debris down the mountainy warehouses and hotels. I promised John Hewitt and Des Wilson, otherwise I wouldn't venture forth again into this too near to the knuckle disaster. Tired of trying to pretend I am not this frightening freak has something in common with the terrorists of women and children. I read my poem about the icons and guns and ask, now is that sectarian? We're all sectarian here. Some honest person replies in the discussion afterwards, Des Wilson says, I'm frightened of poets. I'm frightened of their perceptions. He wants me to answer. 
Can you put yourself into the mind of the man who kills? No, I lied to the priest. I can't. But I can. I am polluted. With the poison of violence born and bred into it, I'm dying of those dark looks I get from boys, soldiers, from slits and pigs, and I try to rub the hatred from my eyes, but it's deeper than looks. The black is in my lungs now and in my poems. <laughs>